be here with you guys and be here with the Lord and just, and just have a good time in His presence. And so I thank you for that. Today's uh, title of the sermon, and I don't know if, if Jimmy will be able to get that up. He's back there doing double duty. CJ's at, uh, at work. And so Jim's back there doing the camera and, and the PowerPoint, and, and so we're thankful for that. And he, you didn't know you were going to get your exercise today, did you? Huh? <laughs> so, but today's title of the sermon, along this uh, Clean Your Garage series, is uh, Get Rid of That Old Thing. Get Rid of That Old Thing. And we all know we have some things that, that uh, actually I have some things that I really love that Crystal tries to throw away every time. It's clean out day, Right. Uh, I go to the, the donation bag, and I find that it's filled up with mostly my stuff. And I don't, that's, I mean, maybe she's trying to say you need to get rid of that old thing. But uh, what made me think of that was this thing here. I don't know if you guys remember these. <laughs> but I got to tell you, I don't know that there's really anything I have that is this soft. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually kind of warm, but when I was thinking of get rid of that old thing, I think the Lord was trying to tell me, this is what popped into my head, was that this thing here, and I really don't want to get rid of it. I, I, it's comfortable, you know. Um, I know some people think it's hideous to look at, but I mean, who says blue, red, and yellow don't go with brown? I mean, who says that? I don't know. I think, I think so. But uh, get rid of your old thing. And actually, I would have put this on, but it would mess up the microphone and all of that. And, but uh, we all have things like this around the house that we hold on to because it's comfortable. We're used to it, right? And this is you know, if, if I am having a lazy day, a rainy, cold, lazy day around the house, this is my go-to. This is what I want to stay in because it's comfortable. And last week, CJ was talking about the power of the blood of Jesus and his ability because of what he had done to change us and in a new creation. And so I wanted to kind of build on top of that a little bit today about our way and the Lord's way. What we, when I say we, I'm talking about the world, about our natural inclination, about the world's way to greatness, and what greatness looks like in the kingdom of Christ. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that today. And we know that this is kind of an inward battle that we battle with all the time, this, this natural go-to for us, selfishness. It's, it's, it's comfortable for us. We, we don't have to be taught this. We, we can see the 18-year-old, 18-month-old individual knows all about me, myself, and I, right? Yes. And we don't have to be taught that. This is a natural thing, and so we, we gravitate to that. But when we're talking about the kingdom of Christ, selfishness, pride, these are the things that God hates. And they're comfortable for us. And we like, that's our go-to when, when someone offends me or whatever. It's that fight, fight or flight. And usually for me, it's more of a fight thing. But uh, it comes up inside of us. And it's, and it's our go-to. And we're comfortable with it because that's what we're used to. But God wants something more for us. And so... Uh, a couple examples of, in this, in Proverbs cha chapter 6, and the bulk of our lesson is going to be found in Mark chapter 10. So if you have a Bible, if you want to go to Mark chapter 10, that's where we're going to camp out most of the time. Or if you have your phone Bible, most of the teenagers have a phone Bible, you can get into Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 31. But I have a couple of verses we'll go to before we get to Mark chapter 10. The first one would be Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. Haughty eyes. This is the reason why I started with this. Haughty eyes is, is a prideful thing. And so when he's listing off seven things that the Lord hates, number one, the headliner right there is pride. Prideful eyes is selfishness. A lying tongue, which we often use to benefit ourselves. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. I think it doesn't take, it wouldn't take a whole lot of wordsmithing to see that many of those things are, can all be tied up into a selfish heart. 
Many of the reasons why someone would do these things would have a selfish motivation, a way to, to puff themselves up, pride. In Psalm 138, verse 6, Though the Lord is exalted, He looks kindly on the lowly. The lofty, He sees them afar. And then, of course, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. The mark of a believer of Christ and the evidence of the new creation in us is humility. You can often tell that there is something different about someone when they don't think of themselves constantly. There's something different about that person. See, we all understand our go-to. We're comfortable with the selfishness. In fact, many times when we complain, when we're complaining, it's, ha- it's got a selfish motivation into it. So one of the things I tried to drill into our young people, and I can usually point at Seth for this because he's got this down, but if I was to say, if there's one thing you can do to set yourself apart from anybody else in this world, what would that be? And he would say, don't complain. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? In, in, in today's day and age, if you're around somebody who just doesn't complain, that alone will make you stick out. But it's, a, it's selflessness, it's, a, it's a humility, it's not thinking of yourself more highly than others. And that's part of the new creation, getting away from the old and getting into the new. And this is something that is very hard for us to get out of. And so today's passage in Mark chapter 10, we're going to talk about the disciples who were walking with Jesus and were receiving lessons directly from the master's mouth himself, and it still didn't produce humility in them. See, in Mark chapter 10, verse 31, we'll start there. Jesus knew this in their hearts, right? Jesus didn't need to be told many things about our our minds and hearts, right? He knows already what's going on in there. So he knows that, that the disciples, because they have been chosen, because they're the 12, because they're walking around with Jesus, that there's a little bit of pride in their hearts. And so he says this to them, but many who are first will be last and the last first. So he's trying to tell his disciples there, already knowing the pride in their hearts, that, hey, guys, everyone is equal. Everyone needs salvation. Everyone needs forgiveness. Everyone needs Christ's death on the cross. Everyone needs is the same. They don't have enough love on their own. Everybody's equal. We're skipping on to verse 35. And it's almost like James and John were listening to this lesson, right? They were listening to Jesus say this, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great lesson, Master. Great lesson. And they come to Jesus here in verse 35 and they say to Him, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. (laughs) Can you imagine going up to the creator of the universe and have that much, I don't know what you would call it, gumption, uh, ambition, pride, (laughs) ignorance, to come up to Jesus and say, We want you to do whatever we ask you to. The immaturity there, right? I can imagine, I think back to myself sometimes when I've learned this thing, to never say never before the Lord. I've learned to just never say never. Why? Because I learned that I really don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) I really don't know the future. I don't know what's coming up. I don't know no further than the end of my nose. And so I have beginning, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting, beginning to learn to stop giving God advice about how to deal with a certain situation. <laughs> but that's what we see here with James and John. And we know in some other passages that their mother was there with them. And they say, we want you to do for us whatever you ask. And of course, Jesus being the God, the mature 
parent, he isn't going to give a blank check to James and John. He knows what's in their heart. And so instead of just saying, sure, whatever you want, he just says, gets right to it. Verse 36, what do you want me to do for you? As if he needed them to tell him. But they went ahead and said, verse 37, they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. See, what's going on here, this isn't like some, some out of the realm, where did you get this from, James and John request? See, this is how the world operates. This is how rulers operated. They would take very close family members and they would put them at their right or left and elevate them to a place of importance. And it's believed by many that there are certain scriptures, and that's another topic for another day, that Salome, James and John's mother, was related to Mary of Jesus. And so James and John were cousins with Jesus. And so this was not out of the, out of the stratosphere ridiculous request to ask. This is how the world operates. This is what they do. This is what James and John has seen. And so they were going to have the ambition and they were going to have the courage and the guts. It's almost as if they had read some kind of self-help book that the world puts out that we see in all kinds of bookstores all over the world. How to create success in your life. James and John, they read that book. And so they decided to, to have some courage and they took a leap of faith and stepped out there and they were assertive and they were the first ones to ask Jesus this question. Of course, they had no idea how completely ignorant they were. They had no completely idea that this isn't what the kingdom of Christ is about. They were just operating in their normal way the way they have been taught, the way they have seen the world operate. And so, Jesus goes on in Mark chapter 10, verse 38. And he says to them, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And of course, we can see this today when we promote ourselves, we're really selling ourselves, right? We promote ourselves, we start to breed an overconfidence. We start to breed in on ourselves an overconfidence. And, and this is one of the biggest things that plagues our young people today. See, many of our young people today, this was the first time in, in human history that many of our young people were able to go get answers to questions with, and they didn't have to go get it from their, their parents. They didn't have to necessarily go get it from a teacher. They, the answers to their questions were in the palm of their hand. And so all of this created this sense of knowledge in their head, but they had no experience in getting it, or they didn't have to learn lessons. They just Googled it, and, and then there, and there they went. And so many of our young people, what plagues them is this overconfidence, that they're able to accomplish many things in this, in this world, but then they get into real world situation and they're frightened. They don't know how to get through someone offering criticism. They don't know how to get through things like this that experience teaches. So there's this, this overconfidence in them. And so today we have these social media influencers. And I can't imagine or think of anybody in this world who is more self-promoting than these people. But when that happens, it creates a sense of overconfidence. And so James and John had no idea what was coming to Jesus. I mean, they were thinking Jesus is going to come here. He's going to put Rome down. I mean, he was able to create all kinds of miracles. He can call down angels. He can, he can be on the, the giant, most biggest stallion in the world. His sword is longer than anybody else's. And I want to be right up there with him. They had no idea what was coming. No idea. So verse 39, I imagine their chests were puffed out a little bit, you know. You know how we get like this? Yes, we can, they said. Yes, we can. <laughs> Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left 
is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. This whole time, Jesus has been modeling true humility before the disciples. Submitting to the Father. He's saying right here, even in his answer to this very puffed up and prideful request, Jesus is displaying, submitting his will to the Father. Those aren't mine to give. They can't see it because they're so ingrained and trained in the way the world sees things. And then, of course, selfishness and self-promoting, it breeds competitiveness. See, in the world today, you know, it, competitiveness is a, is a good thing. It is, a, it is something that drives businesses to be better. Competition gives everybody better prices, and the businesses get better because this person is doing that, this person is doing that. But it breeds competitiveness and a selfishness does. And so we see that the request of James and John lights a little fire in the other disciples. Mark 10, verse 41. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Do you think they were indignant because James and John were messing around with something righteous? That inside, they were like, this is, this is not right. This is immoral for you to do this. Do you think that's why they were angry? Or do you think they were angry because James and John beat them to the punch? <laughs> I, they were angry because they were thinking, why can't I sit? I mean, why you? What about me? What about me? So Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. See, Jesus is taking this moment to teach a lesson to them and let us sit here and be taught the same lesson. Because in this world, you are taught to be ambitious, self-promoting, and then the byproducts of that is that we become arrogant and prideful, and there are people in this world who want to rule others in a dictatorial and domineering way. They seek power and fame, usually at the expense of others. That's the way the world teaches us, us that that is the path to greatness in this world. But Jesus wants to contrast that worldly, self-promoting way to greatness with true greatness in Christ's kingdom. Self-denial. Self-denial. So Jesus says in verse 43, chapter 10, verse 43, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. This is the Greek word, diakonos, servant. Literally refers to someone waiting at a table. To be a servant. This is not our go-to. We're not used to that. that. That's not warm and fuzzy and cozy. That's not, that's uncomfortable. That goes against what I want for today. I'm sorry, I got plans for today. But for us, not for anybody else, but for his believers, we are to be servants, diakonos. But it, Jesus goes even further than that. Jesus goes even further than that. Verse 44, and whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. Slave. This is the word, the Greek word, doulos. And it means slave. Like what we think of when we think of slave. This is very uncomfortable for us here in America. This word, in, many, in fact, you can do a research on this. This word, doulos, many times when it is used in the New Testament to mean slave, they actually translate it to mean servant. Because servant is less uncomfortable than slave. But this is what Jesus is telling us. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. He flips everything upside down. Jesus takes what we think is our natural intuition and he flips it upside down. 
So if you want to be great in Christ's kingdom, you must be a slave of all. See, we think to be great in the kingdom, we lord over someone. We rule them. We make them do something they don't want to do. That's what's greatness in the world. But Jesus says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you will be slave to them. That's just uncomfortable. And so Jesus, of course, sets this example for anybody who wants to doubt that, that maybe Jesus really didn't mean slave Look at his example. Look at what he did for us on the cross. Verse 45, Jesus goes on, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Look at Jesus' life if you doubt at all that he's calling us to a life of being a slave. Look at his example. That's so against our na nature. That's so against our nature. And we can't do that. I don't have enough love to do that. So I got a little, little object lesson. I need some volunteers from some kiddos here. Come on up here, pal. Mira, come on. Come on up here. Noah, come on up here. Come on. That's all right. It's okay. Everybody's going to be looking at you. It's no problem. <laughs> Come on over here in the front. Come on over here in the front. I got a very simple object lesson for you guys. Okay. So we're going to say that this, this, this mug right here represents your friend. All right? Your friend. He's hurting. Your friend needs a whole lot of love poured into him. And this little, you know what that says right there? Our love. Our love. Just so some of you guys know, Crystal didn't pl plaster all this. I did this. So... It's all crumpled and, and uneven, and it really irritates Crystal. But I did this, not her, so just so you know. Um, and I would like to say that I did that on purpose to irritate her. This is just how I do stuff. <laughs> I'm not very artsy. So this cup here is going to represent our love. And our friend here, our friend needs some love from us. So what I need you to do... You see, I cut this in the shape of heart. That's cute, isn't it? <laughs> I need you to suck up the love in your heart there and pour it into your friend who's hurting. Okay, yeah, just go ahead. It's okay. If you make a little mess, it's just water. And just dump it in there and squeeze it all out. Yeah, and fill it all up. And then, yeah, go ahead and get some more. There you go. Yeah. And we're going to keep doing this. And I think you'll notice and realize just from the size, go ahead, keep going, that our love is just not going to be enough to fill our friend up. We just don't have enough. We can sit there and try and we'll work on it. And as we deplete ourselves, we don't have any love left in us. The next person that comes along, we kind of bite their head off sometimes, right? Because we've given all the love we have left. And so we don't have enough to help them out. And so, as, as our friend keeps working on that, there's a better way. There's a better way. And so, Mira and Nora is going to help us out with this. Yes. I thought, you're going to keep working over here. I thought what would be real funny was to put the paper confetti in here and pretend like I dumped, but no, I'm not going to do that. So, we have here, what does that say for us there, Noah? Can you tell everybody? God's love. God's love. And so one of the things we need to do, I'm going to have you get this sponge. I'm putting this down where you can reach it. I need you to soak that up into God's love and, and start filling up this big big cup there, our friend's love. So what I, what I think what we need to get from this, folks, is that we don't possess enough love to be selfless. We don't possess enough love to put others first. That doesn't come natural to us. That doesn't come natural to us. And so, you see, our friend here, he's getting pretty low there on his love. And so, that way, when we try to do it on our own, we really don't get very far. 
And so what we're getting ready to talk about here, if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, that will be the next step that we get to. There are going to be some things that Jesus wants us to do that we're commanded to do that we can't do if we're relying on our own strength, relying on our own love. We just can't do it. All right. Thank you, guys. You did a fantastic job. Our friend here, now that you have tapped into God's love, is full. And so what you need to do is go back to God's love and fill your cup up, right? Yes. All right. You guys can go back. <laughs> you can go back. Good job. Give them a round of applause. They did a fantastic job. They did a fantastic job. So we look in, and I'm going to do Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8 first, and then 9 through 11, and then we'll get back to what Jesus wants from us in verse 1 through 4. But first, let's talk about Jesus' example, right? So if we had any doubts that Jesus was calling us to a life of being a slave, let's look at his life in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Paul writes, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on the cross. So if you have any doubts that Jesus wasn't calling us to a life of being a slave to others, let's look at his life. Let's look at what he did for us as being God. We talked about the great star breather, right? We're talking about that God. That God stepped down from His throne to become in the form of a man. If that doesn't tell us what it looks like to be a slave, then I, I don't know what would. But to do that alone, just to come down here and to be come in, in a human form, from God Almighty to human form, that right there should tell us. But He goes beyond that. He was a servant. He was here to serve. He served others. He washed the disciples' feet. The great star breather lowered Himself to the point where He washed these prideful, arrogant people's feet. This is what He's calling us to be, to do. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what Jesus was telling them. To be great in, the, in His kingdom, you need to be less. And so he shows it right here with his own life that he stooped down to our level, became a slave, served, and was exalted to the highest place. That is the way his kingdom works. Love. A love that we don't possess. A love that you could try as hard as you want. And maybe get by on a day, I don't know. I don't have that much love, but I know like Susan, she could get by on a day. She's love, but not me. So what does all this mean for us? Get rid of that old thing. Get rid of that old creation. It's comfortable. We like it, but it isn't what is greatness in his kingdom. That doesn't create greatness in Christ's kingdom. We need to get rid of that old thing and embrace the new in Christ Jesus. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from be being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. See, when we, when we dip... When we dip into God's love, we end up with the same love. Yes. See, if, if we try to do it on our own, we don't have the same love. 
when we try to do it on our own wisdom and our own way and what makes me feel good and this and that and whatever, we're not one in mind, body, and spirit. But if we're all dipping into God's love bucket here, if we're all dipping into this together, then we are of one love. One in spirit, one in mind. And this is what, what Christ is calling His church to. This is what Christ is calling you to. This is what Christ is calling me to. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. So here we go. Something practical for us to work on, church. Right? Some practical stuff. See, there's been this kind of split in theology where if you go to seminary or whatever, there's this attitude where they can get so deep and get so far into the weeds of, of, of theology that it doesn't become practical anymore. And that's not what God wants for us. His Word is practical. His Word teaches us and then He expects us to do. To do. So Philippians 2, verse 3 through 4. So how do I know that He wants us to do? The very first word, verse 3, do nothing out of selfishness or out of vainglory. Rather, humbly regard others as more important than yourselves, each looking out not for his own interests, but also everyone for those of others. Here's the practical stuff we're supposed to do, church. All right, does it surprise anyone that he says, don't do anything out of selfishness? That's the headliner, right? Because that's the beginning of the big snowball. Once you start doing stuff out of selfishness, it just rolls up on itself and it becomes this big, ugly pile of destruction. So don't be selfish. I mean, don't puff yourself up. And in other verses, it's translated, be humility of mind. Be of humility of mind. It said, in this version, it says out of vainglory, but in humility of mind. See, to the Greeks, that phrase was a derisive comment. If you really wanted to speak down to someone, you would tell them you are humble in your mind. You have humility of mind. See, that's what they spoke about somebody who had no value. That's what they would say of somebody who was a slave. That's somebody who doesn't count. You have humility of mind. And so when Paul was writing this, meaning to the Greeks, this uncomfortable feeling started to come over. I don't want to be considered humility of mind because I know what that means. But he's trying to say what Jesus is saying. To be great in His kingdom, you must be humility of mind. It shouldn't surprise us that humility of mind in the New Testament is a positive thing. That it's actually something we should want, not avoid. Training the new to get out of the old. That's what he wants from us. And then he goes on to say, humbly regard that word. I'm going like a little word search here. I like to do that sometimes to see what the Greek word is. Regard. It means more than just having an opinion. Okay? It is a carefully thought out conclusion based on the truth. So what is Paul saying to us here? It does not mean to pretend that others are more important than I. It means to believe it. It means to know it. It means to know that others are more important than me. That's what that humbly regard others means. That they are more important than us. Our interest should be that of Christ's. And when we're all one, working together, you'll see what Jesus does with His church and His community. If we come here looking out for one another, Praying for one another. Not having a selfish ambition. I hate to say this, but if you look at all the books in the Christian bookstores, the people who attend churches in America today, they come here so they can get theirs. 
That makes us no different than James and John going to Jesus and say, we want you to do whatever we ask. People come to church with that attitude on their heart. We should be here looking out, not for our interests, but for the interests of others. You see, when you do, when you flip up your worldly wisdom upside down, you see God work in your life. To receive, you must give. That makes no sense to the world. But to someone who follows Christ, they know exactly what that means. Yes. And so we're going to do something a little different. We've got five steps to help us work on this thinking of others first. Five steps. Five. And, and you can go through Scripture, guys, and there's a million steps. But for sake of time and, and clarity, these are just five things that we can get from Scripture. Five things. First one. Don't assume that others have evil motives behind what they do. 1 Corinthians 13 and 7 says, Love believes all things. Rather, put the best possible interpretation on someone's actions. It's because somebody does something that you wouldn't have done. Let's not automatically jump to the conclusion they did it out of evil intentions. But let's receive it in love and grace. Two, don't assume that your time, money, energy, thoughts, and opinions are more valuable than your neighbors. Philippians 2 and 3, we just talked about that. We're not all going to agree on stuff here, right? That's okay, right? Three, be alert not only to your own needs, but to the needs of others. Philippians 2 and 3. Four, Demonstrate your high estimation of others by commending them for those qualities that are biblically worthy of praise. So we're always tying everything back to Christ. But it's, it's okay to recognize that in one another and go in and encourage people with that. Some of us have that gift that comes naturally to us. Some of us we don't. and We need to rely on God's love. To recognize that and to do that. And he does that for us. And in five, this is the one we're going to do. This is the one we're going to do today. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. John chapter 15, verse 12, it says, This is my commandment. Love one another as I love you. So today we're going to do a little bit of that. So I, I want you to bear with me a little bit. I wanted to do this for our kids. We have all of our kids here and I think this is good for us and this is a good lesson for our kids to do this with them. And, and so I kind of talked about this on Wednesday. So some of you had a heads up on this. I want you to go find someone. You did it great. You had practice in the beginning when we mingled. You did great. I want you to go find someone that you're going to pray for this week. Every day this week, you're going to pray for that individual. And then maybe that person will give you some ideas of how you could pray for them. Maybe they won't. It doesn't matter. The Lord knows everything. You're going to pray for that individual. And so I, maybe some families can get with families, or you can get with individuals, or you could be in the groups of three. Nobody's going to be left out. Everybody's going to pray for one another. This is what God commands us to do. So we're actually going to put some of His words in practical use. And so while you guys do that, I have some, some of my teenagers. I have some of them. I talk to them. I have, I'm going to have their help. They're going to give you a bracelet. It's one of those bracelets that you get at a fair or something like that. And this is what I was thinking more for our kids, but adults, we need this too, okay? And you can wear it if you want to wear it. I understand some people just will not wear it. That's fine. Make sure you put the bracelet somewhere where you'll see it every day. But for some of our kids, if, if our parents are wearing these bracelets, this, these will be wonderful opportunities to share Jesus with people. They're going to ask. People are curious. 
What's that on your, what's up, why are you wearing that, that dumpy old bracelet? What's that all about? And then you have the opportunity to, hey, we're praying for one another. Jesus commanded us to love one another. This is what we're going to do. And so it would be a handy witness tool if you choose to use it that way. But what I would like for you to do as these kids, as you meet up with your person and you're talking to them and we're going to pray for, I'm going to pray for you, you're going to pray for me. You're going to get this bracelet and I want you to write their name down on that bracelet. So it'll remind you. I'm more of like a, a prayer grazer, so I won't just have one big prayer for you at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, but I'll be praying for you all day long. Every time I'll see that name, I'll just say out a quick prayer for that individual. And so as we do this, go to maybe the Lord will direct you to somebody. Maybe you'll go to somebody you're comfortable with. Whoever, whatever, I want you to get up. Families find families. Individuals find individuals. Groups of people find groups of people. Just find your people and, and get that going. And teenagers, I want you to come up here and get these bracelets. So go. Go.